my dear friends welcome to the third edition of india first leadership talk series today we are very excited because we have a very very special guest some people call him james bond of india or some people call him real life bomkesh bakshi so today we have our national security advisor sri ajit doval ji with us and today we will discuss with him about art of decision making ajit sir welcome to our show so when we announced uh, that you will be joining us for india first leadership talk series uh, there was huge enthusiasm within students and within cup two or three days we got about 600 to 700 questions then subsequently we had to cancel the show because uh, some unfortunate incidents happened and uh, then we are now we, until now we have received about 950 questions from students when we scan those questions lot of those questions were dealing with india's very sensitive security kind of uh, inquiries or um, they were keen on knowing about it so we couldn't take many of those questions but still we have tried to compile some of them and you can answer based on your ease of dealing uh, with uh, some of these things so the first question sir is a very very interesting question uh, and it actually is about the air strikes or surgical strikes which uh, were done before so the students are very very keen on knowing that you might be there in the war room while monitoring the entire situation minute by minute maybe so what was going in your mind and whether at any point of time you had the fear of actually uh, uh, or have a feeling i had a feeling that uh, the decision may go wrong or uh, you know of you have taken the wrong decision so sir what was your psyche at that moment uh well i i can't go into the specifics of uh, many operations or this particular operation uh, but i'll tell you one thing we are all human beings and human brain human psyche human this thing operates almost similarly the difference is how do you respond to it very true see it's just like the rainfall mm -hmm. it falls on all of us equally but with some people can catch cold some people are better clad some people have got the rain coat some people have with this thing so the important thing is whenever you take major decisions whenever you take vital decisions there is always a sense of anxiety uncertainty because you are not a crystal gazer you cannot tell the future and you get to know whether the decision was right or wrong only after the event is over so the die has been cast but more important thing is how do you cope with that how do you plan for that now the way i can tell you is this that is if i take a decision i work out a worst case scenario i will say if everything goes wrong what will happen and then you find that okay if everything goes wrong what can happen is affordable you may get a little bad press you may get some bad media but nation will suffer maybe sometimes we may lose some lives it doesn't matter but we can manage with that the country can bear that shock after having worked out the worst case scenario you try to improve on that that is how do i see that is if you know if i buy a lottery ticket or if i if i if i say that if i'm going to do a job is going to cost me 500 rupees if it is wrong but i say how can i reduce the cost 
So you start making preparations to make it more affordable till you bring it to the point where you think that the risk is worth taking, which requires time, which requires preparation, which at times in our job requires technology, a superior intelligence, and all these things. So you, uh, the point I was trying to make is that to deal with fear, articulate their fear in specific words, and you'll find the fear is not very big. It is not as big as you're really worried about. It is much less than that. Not only that, you can further reduce it by through a preparation, through a better knowledge, through a better understanding, and through hard work. Then the another important thing is that for vital decisions, you must have a contingency plan. That is the fallback position. If things, you know, whatever you do, a situation gets changed. Now that situation is a new situation that you have to cope with. And if you have got to cope with that situation, that is what we say is the new contingency. It can be favorable, it can be unfavorable. Say you are talking about this uh, operation of Balakot. Now thereafter the media is uh, the same. Well, this is a new situation. It's a favorable situation, but still a new situation. So you plan with it that how will you do the perception management? Or how will you, or then there will be an international decision. So you will work out that is what will be your contingency plans after the news, the old one is over, favorable or unfavorable, a new situation will emerge, and then you have got to deal with that. So I think thereafter the fear level becomes very low. You know that when you have cattle for it, you know that you are prepared for it, you know that you have got the uh, requisite talent, knowledge, resources, and everything has been lined up, come, come what may, and we will deal with it. Sir, uh, the fear can be handled, as you rightly said, uh, through right kind of mental preparation and training. But sometimes, while decision making, you hardly have few choices. And then you have to really take tough decisions. How and when it comes to national security, and if you have to take a tough decision, then it has a long-term repercussions. It may have long, generations may get affected. So when you are taking a tough decision, what considerations you actually give? It, it is a bit different than fear for fear of taking decision. Well, first let us understand that we all take hundreds of decisions every day. Whether what to dress or what to eat or where to sit or you buy this thing. What exactly makes a decision tough? What are the tough decisions? Tough decisions are where the consequences are going to affect a large number of people for a long period of time. The risks are high because some of those wrong decisions may change the course of history. Like say, when India got its independence and the merger of the states was going, a decision was taken that is, let us go to the United Nations because the, from the Pakistani side, the masquerade has come with arms and others, rather than taking them headlong strongly, we thought that let us go to the United Nations and thereafter we got into a situation where it became internationalized and we could not, the Pakistan occupied Kashmir liberated. So that was a decision that has got a long term consequences. Even till today, all the problems of Kashmir are because of that. Otherwise, 535 states had been uh, merged with India. So it was also one of the other princely states which had merged with India. But since we had taken the decision to go to the United Nations and thereby we found it difficult that the UN position was not something which was in consonance with our national interest. So how do you take the tough decisions? The first thing is 
that you must have clarity of objectives. Take out all adjectives, all adverbs. It should be only the nouns and the verbs. Make it as small and as simple as possible. Don't say we are going to fight terrorism. That is not the objective. In this particular case, say that we are going to neutralize on such and such date, such and such person, or such and such module, or such and such thing like that. That is a specific course of action about which you have got a clarity. And when that happens, this is the next thing that I have got to do. So your objectives must be very well defined. We normally, particularly the Indian mind, gets bogged down with a lot of philosophies, thinkings, thoughts, worries, anxieties and others. But on the focus, it is not very clear about its objectives. After that, you must do an objective analysis of your strengths, of your circumstances, of your limitations, of the resources available, of the possibilities that can happen. Now, when I say objective, it is very, very important. And that makes sense in my case. I never take a decision. I ask myself some questions. Am I angry? If I am angry, I never take a decision. Because normally, you are not taking an objective decision. Your objectivity suffers when you are angry. Am I afraid? If I am afraid, my decisions are not objective. The security of my life becomes more important for me. So my decision will be affected that after this, whether I will come alive or I will be dead. So I will say, okay, I will wait for another day. I will take a decision tomorrow. When I have sublimated myself, that no, it doesn't matter. If I die, I die. I am prepared for that. I made arrangements for anything that I care for or anything that I that is my responsibility. Whether you are upset, whether you feel that your personal interests are at stake, that you may lose the job or you may lose the, uh, the things, you know, there are a lot of anxieties that the people can have. Don't take a decision. Let it stabilize. You must take a decision to be objective in a completely calm state of in a completely composed state of mind, in a completely neutral state of mind. Then, after you have got the objectives defined, see what are the different options by which you can achieve those objectives. Tough decisions do not leave many options, but still there are options. And your experience, your knowledge makes those options, create those operations, or those options. So you say that, okay, I have to go from here to cannot place. How do you select the best option? Each option has got a cost. Each option has got a time. Each option has got the opportunities in which it can be done. What suits you best? That is the best option, which is most cost effective and sure to get your objective. Now, who are the people normally do not take wrong decisions, they adopt a wrong option. Ah. Which they say that our decision was wrong. It was not the decision that was wrong. It was the option that you adopted for it that was wrong. And why did you adopt the wrong option? Because you had not researched it. Your knowledge, your database, your experience, your communication with the people that did this thing, you had not done that well. And therefore, you select an option that is, I decide to go to Connaught Place why am I at Chandni Chowk? And then I say, well, it has taken me two hours. It is not that going to Connaught Place was bad. It is that you decided to go the wrong way. How do you collect the wrong way? When you see the map, when you know the every street and the, uh, every turn into the map, and then you will reach in the fastest possible way using the minimum amount of patrol and the time. So work out your options and prepare for it. After you have selected the option, then start preparing for it. And that is the most important thing. And I want to emphasize on this, that this is very, very important that you have to give your best. Your decisions are not right or wrong. What happens is this, that you take a decision, 
but then you don't work towards it to fructify it with a total commitment with total uh, you know give your best in every way you know in life it is important to make right decisions but there's something which is still more important that is to make the decisions right once you have taken the decision you know it's a right you know one uh, you are all young people and tomorrow you may like to select a spouse for you a life partner for yourself you will be thinking that probably the secret lies in selecting the right partner probably yes but more of it lies whether you can make that marriage right very true so taking the right decision is less important than making the decision right after you have taken a decision then it is your bravery it is your commitment it is your uh, foresightedness it is your sense of tolerance your ability to take this thing that you make the decision right since you have taken it and you have got a responsibility theek hai galat decision agar ho bhi gaya thoda sa galti bhi hai in spite of that you try to make it right and so concentrate more on act more on action than keep on changing your decisions you have taken a decision go ahead with it so we have received another very interesting question uh, and it's more about your style of functioning uh, you must have done hundreds of operations in india or in abroad uh, and uh, many people call you as a more of a solo flyer so sir what makes ajit doval different from others well it is true that is uh, i have handled large number of operations because i was posted all my life in that actually very young in my career i was i know for what reasons they thought that well i can go for the operations and thereafter i got uh, remained in these uh, games till i became the chief but actually i have never given it a thought that in any way whether i am different i feel that every human being god's each creation is unique if two fingerprints cannot be same how can be the two individuals or the personalities be identical they have got to be different i may be different too but maybe the product of my own upbringing education experiences of life might have brought, brought uh, might have uh, certain anxieties or certain not anxieties certain type of peculiarities might have cropped in and as i get the feedback you are right that is generally that people think that i am uh i am solo this things and i try to do this thing well it is sometimes said in a negative way sometimes people tell it in a positive way but there is one thing why i have been a more of a solo uh, operator i think that well i can probably know my circumstances what i can risk why should i make others risk their circumstances maybe that they will do it by their orders or by the this thing like that but when i do it it is my belief let them do the things that they believe in so for me a very strong belief or a commitment in what i am going to do i know that i will do it he may be doubtful in sanskrit we say sanshayatna vinashay mm-hmm. if you are in doubt you will never succeed particularly an operator so whatever i do i am never in a doubt i know i have decided to take this path i have done my due diligence i have done the research i have done the this thing i prepared myself i have equipped myself and thereafter i will do that so that may there are some people that will be fine that will they will take it as an order but their commitment and their belief level is not same secondly i would not like others to take the risks for which totally my creation my mess you know i can i can you know, a lot of things are talked about this thing that some books have been written mr marwa has also written about it that is when we had a lot of these things in 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 uh, golden temple and uh, about 300 terrorists with this thing had gone inside and then they were committing this things others and going inside and then we had to take a this thing the operation black thunder at that point of time well somebody had to go inside with whatever cover with whatever identity and well i was the head of operations i don't have to be this myself i could have put i know that the chances of his survival are very little particularly when he is go for a long period and come and go again and again so they told me that well sir we will accompany you 
I said, nobody will accompany me. I will become more vulnerable if somebody is there with me. There is another thing in intelligence operations, you are the safest I mean, you if you are alone. alone. Because nobody can contradict you. Even if you are caught, it is your lies that will pass off. And if you are too smart and intelligent, you will be able to take them around and think, you do not know what the other man is at. Not that he is wrong, but he is different. So they can find the loopholes. But anyway, being solo fight, this is one. The other thing that has been this, which has been talked about me, is that there is a lot of surprise in the operations that I take. There is one another thing in which I had been working is I never repeat the same thing twice. I have never, I think, uh, I started this uh, uh, racket when I was in my 20s, and now I'm 75. I have never done anything twice. I, I always liked doing everything uh, differently, as if I was, it's the first thing that I'm doing. Every operation, whether big or small, mm. is the first of my life. So I do it with that spirit of a new child, as he starts it. Because then you do not depend and you do not have any assumptions. Mm. If I was lucky last time, what is the guarantee I'd be lucky this time? Validate your assumptions again. This is the task, small. If I have to, just because I made the uh, uh, biryani very good yesterday, there's no guarantee I will do it today as well. I will have to see that today the chicken may be more tender or it may be more soft or the rice may be better. It may not be this thing. Everything in life, every second of your life is the first second of the rest of your life. Every day in your life is the first day of the life that is left. Start it like that. So I guess there is a, this thing, then the speed. And they say that, well, even if I walk, I walk very fast. If I speak, I speak very fast. Uh, I think that if you can, even if you are, there has been an intelligence leak and your adversary has come to know about it, by the time he analyzes it, by the time he understands it, if you have got a speed, you have got to defeat him by days or by hours or by minutes or seconds, he will get you, but he reached there only a couple of minutes later. You are out from there. So be, be fast to hit and to quit. So I, speech that is, that is very relevant. Don't, to what get, we don't get into uh, too much of a procrastination and, and this thing like that, it's a speech. And secrecy, of course, is a part of this profession, but uh, I always believe that uh, uh, you must have the ability, that is, you can articulate, you can mix, you can talk, but you will always be able to, the vital secrets must be kept this thing. So, ultimate secret, which becomes a lifestyle over a period of time, that is, you remain a secretive person. So, I think that is the things that in which my, in the operational work that I have done and which I feel that the others feel that uh, there have been a certain amount of what they call is an S4, that there is a surprise, there is a speed, there is a secrecy, and then there is a um, um, solo. So, <laughs> so it is the thing that. So you said something very, very interesting about speed, secrecy. So it actually evolves from psyche also, you know, what kind of psyche a person has developed over a period of time. So would you like to share with us few events in your life which has actually helped you develop this psyche? Well, there is no event which I manufactured or which I planned that it will affect my psyche. The things that you plan, they don't affect your psyche because you have planned for it. Mm. Things that affect your psyche is something that happens and you have not planned for it and then leave a mark. If I recall, I think, in a way, I, I had little troubled childhood. My father was an army officer, mm. and I was born as a son after, after his, after his this thing, the whole family. I was the son after a gap of about say forty years, mm -hmm. and uh, I had a lot of boys, and then I had, lot, I had sisters. So I was very pampered, and my grandfather and my mother and everybody felt that. Uh, so I became a very pampered child. To some extent, a spoiled child, as it happens. So my father 
sent me to a boarding school. So I went to military school. I was about eight years that time. So I left my home at the age of eight, and I went to, at that time, it was known as King George's Royal Indian Military College. Later became King George's School, and now it's known as a military school. That is when I, these things in my life, from the coziness of the house to the loneliness of a boarding house, I developed a thing. I, I used to weep for long hours after it was dark because you were sleeping alone. But soon I learned in this life you have to be alone. And you have to find your, your, your pains, your pleasures, your comforts. It's all in you. So you have got. So I became a loner, which I remained and which suited my profession. But it also made me this thing that I am responsible for whatever I do. If I get beaten up by the other students, it is because uh, I have not been able to, uh, to, uh, to manage them well. And if I get this thing like this, so that is the first event in my life, which when I see in the retrospect, that is, gave me this thing that if I have to do a thing, I have to do it alone. If I have got, to, I have got to be self-dependent. And everything that I do, I am responsible for. Everything that happens to me, nobody else is responsible for that except me, good or bad. I have got to bear the consequences. The second was that school had a very uh, strange motto, which still is, they have not changed it. The very, very old school, the uh, military school, it has got to school. play the game. They used to think that, well, it's more important that, uh, the, you know, the students were brought there in very young age. They must learn to play the game and inculcate certain qualities which come through the, this ego game. And every child was allotted some game. So I was in the Chetwood house um, in that this thing, and then when the uh, selection started for this thing, some people were taken for uh, football and so for hockey and others. I was this thing for boxing. Mm, boxing. It's a very interesting story. Anyway, at the school level, everybody plays, so I was also there. I was a reasonably good school time boxer and everything. thing. But my, uh, he was also our, my, my house teacher and also the, um, these things. He told me one day a story. He said, do you know why I selected you for the boxing? This thing. He said, you have got a very unique quality. I was, of course, at that, when you are very young at the age, nobody knows who you are tall, who you are short. So all are short of this thing only by small inches or half inches or something like that. So you don't have this thing. He said, that is, you never accepted a defeat. When we are beaten up and you are beaten up, you will never come out of the ring. Even when you are bleeding, even when you are this thing, you will continue. Not that you were the best fighter, mm -hmm. but you had great resilience. I will win the war, not because I'm the strongest, but I will not quit. I can wait, prepare myself, and wait for years and years. And he said, that is what I thought, that psychologically a boxer's quality, that is, you will stay in the ring up to the last round. Even when you have lost the rounds, even when you have been beaten up, even when you are bleeding, he said, there were much better boys who could be this thing. Mm -hmm. But the moment they got one or two of the jabs or something like that, etc., thereafter, they just wanted to quit. Mm -hmm. Or this thing like that. You kept on getting beaten up and things like that, but you stayed there. Over the period of time, you learned that trick. So probably you started winning also. Mm -hmm. It was a big this thing. And he said that, well, it's a quality, not good or bad. Mm -hmm. But remember that this is your strength. If you can hold in the face of adversity for a long time. That's why my tenures have been very long. Mm -hmm. I went to North East, I was there for seven years. I went to Pakistan, I was there for seven years. I can hold on. You can torture me for this thing like that, I cannot bear it. Mm -hmm. I can bear injustice for a long time mm -hmm. without losing my this thing and others. 
So I think as, as a person of this thing, my becoming independent at a very young age and thereafter getting beaten up to understand that well, you, can give, uh, you can get beaten up, but you can still win. So you took the right decision of actually... No, I don't. There were circumstances. Yes. As I said, if you take a decision, it cannot affect your psyche. Mm. You know, if I decide to do something, I prepared myself. My mind, reasoning faculty has been involved. Mm. So it will not the same. What happens in life, mm. that changes your psyche. So, so when uh, I didn't go to this boarding school to change my psyche, but I suddenly realized that mother's comfort is not there. And they're all boys who are all, you know, particularly the boys, mm. when they see a new person, they all are his enemies yes. till they settle down. To begin with, you have to beat each other. And the one the, who, who comes, the new one, he's the one who is beaten by everyone. <laughs> so we have a pillow bed. Everybody will bounce on you. Right. So it's all right. That is a process of growing because after some time, you become the senior. <laughs> so, but you, did, you do not know that uh, uh, how it is going to affect you. Mm. But that, this thing, that in this entire world, it is my, it's my strength, it is my resilience, it is my patience, it is my this thing. You have got the choice, you can go to the corner and cry, you can run around and go to the uh, house, uh, uh, house master and say that I have been beaten up and you will tell children not do that, but the next day uh, when you are going, somebody will put you on an elbow like that, mm. somebody else will, this thing, like that. that will keep on happening. You can't prevent the things that are happening to you. It is not, it is important in life what happens to you. What is more important is how do you respond to what happens to you. I think the nature or circumstances were preparing me, mm. not for what happens to me, that is in the hands of others or the God, but it is preparing me for what, how will you respond when something happens to you like that. So you want to say, sir, the decisions rather than being right needs to be circumstantial. No, I don't think that that is also my decision. It is not a binary thing. It is not a decision is right or decision is circumstantial. Number one, nobody takes a wrong decision. Whether it is right or wrong is known only after the event is over. So when you take it, you take it a right because you think it is right. Otherwise, you won't take it. Will you take a poison thinking that it's a poison? You think it's a sweet, somebody has given you a candy and you are having it. Turns out to be poison. At that time, the decision was right because that was the same way then. So it is wrong to say. Secondly, all decisions, whether right or wrong, has to take into consideration many factors. Circumstances is one of them. Now, if I, we are in this room, and somebody comes inside to say, one AK-47 or something like that, that type of this thing like that. This is a particular setting. In this setting, you have got to take a decision. So you may see that, okay, you're taking out of it, this thing is the best thing, or that is, you're trying to see the break the door and getting out of that and seeing that somebody can do, whatever is that. These are the circumstances. It cannot be the same if it is in the veranda. Hmm. But there are eight persons who are armed. It would not be the same if it is on the roadside, where you have got all the this thing to take this thing and take out, pull out your uh, your gun. So circumstances in all decisions, right or wrong, is not the point. Circumstances or the setting is important. But when you can, setting is not the only factor. There are many other factors which I said. What are your objectives? Why are you taking this mission? Why are you? Uh, undergoing these things, they are all important. What is that you want to achieve? What are your resources? What are your this, this thing and others? But this question that whether it should be right or it should be circumstantial means that if it is circumstantial, it will not be right. And if it is right, then it will not be circumstantial. In this case, the right you are talking about more about the morality sense or the value-based sense. If you mean that the value-based sense, then if there is a conflict between what you want to do and what you should do. Or have to do. No, not have to do. What you should do, have to do is a different thing. Mm. What you want to do and what you should do. What you should do is your duty. Mm. What you want to do is your pleasure. Mm. Opt for the second. 
Mm. But if the choice is between what you have to do mm. and what uh, uh, you uh, uh, you are forced to do, there is no choice. Mm. It is not a decision. Mm. It is not a decision. It is somebody else's decision. If you take out a gun and fire at me, it is your decision. That's all. I can at best say that okay, I'll just laugh it off, mm. or I will start crying. But that's all. That is the only decision I have. Mm. Decision is only when there are options. Mm. When there are compulsions, it is not a decision. Interesting take. Another sir questions or a set of questions which we have received from large number of students. Uh, because basically, because these are engineering student, technology students. Uh, about the future of war, future of terrorism, because now information has become a key. Cyber security has become a key. So how students are very keen on knowing. Actually, you are very right. After the Second World War, and with the development of instruments of mass destruction, where there is a guaranteed extinction of the human descent from this planet if the wars, if the great wars really take place. We have, we have gone into an era of the Klotzevagian type war through other means. Conventional wars are not only that they are not affordable because the losses will be so much. If any major country is going to have a war or if there are countries or the major countries who are going to involve with the nuclear weapons and others, it will be a total extinction. It is not the Hiroshima Nagasaki anymore. Hmm. There were hardly the weapons of any of these things of the, of the potency that we have got today. That is one factor that the wars have become unaffordable in terms of losses. But there is another more important factor. That they have, they are increasingly becoming ineffective instruments of achieving your political and military objectives. There is no guarantee that a country with a bigger army, bigger resources, more of a technology, bigger a soft power, international linkages, will be able to win the war. The great power like Soviet Union got defeated from the Mujahideens. In Afghanistan. Or the Americans could not cope with Vietnam. You know, in the asymmetrical warfare, I build up my army so that if your army is smaller, you will, I'll be able to win over you. Now in today's conflict, in case the conventional wars are not going to achieve your military and political objectives, then you don't fight wars only to kill people. You want to achieve something. They are being replaced by wars through other means. What did United States or what did the Western world or the, existing do, the world do when the Soviet forces moved into Afghanistan? There are many options. They could have gone to war against the Soviet Union. They could have done the economic blockade and this thing of the economy. They would have taken the diplomatic this thing and in the, in the United Nations, they would have the sanctions against it. But it itself was a member of the Security Council, so that could not have been done. The people from, from the Islamic world and asked them to start a jihad against the, the Soviet troops. And in that jihad, Finally, they were bled and fatigued to that extent that the uh, Soviet troops had to move. And Afghanistan came under the control of the Taliban government. Success of that distinct is that now we are getting into a fourth generation warfare. A fourth generation warfare will be a warfare against the invisible enemy. Hmm. And in the war against the invisible enemy, Man who will win will be that, who can see the invisible in him. First. That is why the intelligence has become 
the prime factor. If out of 130 crore people, you are able to find the terrorist mm. who just look like you, dress like you, move like you, then probably you win. If you can't, he win. probably you lose. That, this thing is that, the covert warfare is increasingly becoming the poisonous thing. Now, in that, the whole thing goes. So, that is one thing. Second thing is the technology. The mobility of the, this thing has become global. While people operated within a limited geographical distance, now within seconds probably, the, you know, people can find this thing. And the communications. And they can maintain the secrecy of the communications because they can devise new and new methods of other things. There are mobile phones, or probably 50 years back when I joined this thing, well, there was no mobile phones or there is nothing like that on the internet connectivity or the cyberspace you talked about. It. The whole domain, cyber is a frontierless uh, domain. You can destroy the country's entire infrastructure. You can completely seize its uh, economic activity, its banking activity, its power sector, its civil aviation sector, its um, uh, communication sector. Everything you can seize it and put it to a total, total halt. Even on a, uh, in addition to that, now we are in the warfare in a stage of electronic warfare. In the electronic warfare, if the if the plane takes place, I can divert the direction if I know the course of it, thing like that. Even the pilot will have no control. Over. So, in case I can have a, a penetration into its uh, uh, into, into the code and this thing like that, because it's all being electronically managed. This is not so much of the jackstick, even the ejection of the weapon systems. The communications and these things are being, even the signals it is getting is from the uh, radars. Even that is the thing, if you can disturb it, change it, modulate it, or man, uh, uh, amend it, probably you can have this thing like that. So, this is going to have an increasing uh, role in the coming type of the conflicts. And that is why it becomes imp increasingly important that uh, we are able to cope with these type of challenges. So when we are talking about technology, emerging technology, I think the youngsters, the students are at the forefront of technology actually trying to do large number of things. And now with India's uh, impetus for innovation, which we are also championing in big way. Sir, whether any time in your operations, whether you have used any products which were developed or conceptualized by students or actually they were the people who were driving that, something like in movie Uri, they had shown that some drone was used uh, by the NSA uh, in that movie. <laughs> I know the movies are movies, uh, I don't know, comment on that. But I'll tell you one thing, basically in the intelligence domain, they have got their own technology, these things. They hunt for technologies. They try to find out what is available or who are the people. They try to get it through the sources, but do not make them as an integral part of the organization. So even when that technology is acquired, mm. the people who are parting with that technology or with those equipment may not be knowing who is the actual user and why they are using it, mm. why they want it. Whether they are going to use it as it is, or they will modify it, or it will be part of some major component and others, and that is necessary for the secrecy of the organization. But as an NSA, my job is not actually, I am not an intelligence operator anymore. I gave up that profession long back. Uh, I have found, and I have been deeply impressed by the knowledge, by the vision, by the commitment and the interest of our younger generation. Their belief and faith in themselves. There was one group, uh, there was one Indus group which came to me some time back. And they said, well, they want to just in their own satellite, uh, some, some uh, air guys, I think the Google, they had started a competition, mm. international competition. Yes. You know about that? Yes. This thing like that? And they said that then they qualified and then they qualified and thereafter, it was, they were shortlisted and there were only 10 left. And they continued with that and they said that we can help them a bit. I tied to this thing, but there are certain complications. And they also developed some complications of their own. But still, they did very well. Mm. Similarly, with IIT Madras, mm. 
I think we had this thing and then I told the DRDO because we found that they were making some very good this thing which as a drones in the left wing extremist areas, we found it very useful. So I do feel that there is a promise. Um, I do not know in what way the intelligence agencies can make use of them. But in the security field, in the, other, the defense, in the DRDO, in the other areas, I think we are making substantial use of them and we should continue to make use of them. So just we were talking about Uri and the, have you seen that movie, sir? And uh, whether you break cell phones, <laughs> that's what it has always uh, shown in the movie. More important thing is this, no, I have not seen Uri. I have not seen Uri, well, yeah. I was believing this thing. But I have never gone to, uh, uh, to this thing after I joined the IB or I joined the intelligence career. That is long back. So that is, I've never gone to a theater or to a movie theater or to any of these things. Sometimes maybe that with my wife on the television, I might have said, seen some of the movies, but then I don't, I nev I've never been to a mall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and, and naturally I don't have any social lives because I'm not, I'm not supposed to be too visible and by the time I got into a life which was open life, it was too late for everything. But I'm not, and I don't break the, uh, the thing. But, more important point is that in today's security domain, communications are the easiest to infiltrate and penetrate, to compromise you. And communications are the one which is the biggest asset which can give you the speed and others. I can only tell you one small secret. I don't, I don't use mobiles. I don't have any mobile. I manage without that, will people make this thing that will, how do I manage without that, but then, um, I know it is unsafe. Mm. Just I, I don't use computer. Mm. I mean it's computer for internet. Mm. I use computer as a typewriter. Mm. I use computer as a, this thing like that. Mm. But I, what, I don't maintain any of these things with the, mm. uh, the um, I don't correspond with anyone on computers. So, sir, you said you don't use cell phones, you don't uh, use computers for uh, in big way in that no, sense. For communication. Uh, for communication. But there are a large number of uh, your profiles on social media and on Twitter. Uh, so, sir, what's your take? And large number of ideas are propagated as your ideas on many of these platforms. I have got no social media account. I never had one till today. All of them are either well-wishers or with fake or anything. But I think again, I would like to tell my audience mm. that is please don't mistake everything that goes by Ajit Doval's uh, uh, Facebook account or Twitter account and others. I have none. And maybe that someday I may have it after I am not doing anything in the government or something. But I don't have any and I have got to know this. So, but sir, you write articles, you write blogs, or you don't write. So, how many students would like to know how they can listen to your views on a particular topic? You know, there was a period. I, I uh, retired as the chief of IB in 2005. And then I established uh, a think tank, which is known as the Vivekanand International Foundation. Until 2014, I got this thing like that. So I started it from a scratch, and then it was this thing in Chanakipuri now. And during that period, I wrote something. And during that period, I also gave some interviews. And I also delivered some talks. Mm -hmm. That was this interregnum that I that. Except that there is no authentic, these things about what I have said. Probably your channel as an NSC, I don't remember, maybe once or twice. In last five years, this is the only one that I'm coming in public again. I do not know, maybe some sometime else, maybe small event. But there has no been no this thing. And therefore, all the social media and other types, it is uh, not this thing. Now, at this point of time, I don't think my talking or knowing my views are relevant at all. It is the government of India's views. And when the government of India's views, I'm part of it. So, it is, uh, I contribute my bit, but there are many like me who contribute, and there is a decision is taken by the government. And what is communicated to the country is the decision of the government. And it's the decision of the Prime Minister Modi in most of the cases since I'm his advisor. So as a country's national security advisor and as a advisor, like that, 
I may advise him, but the decisions and this thing is of the Prime Minister and it is the Prime Minister's ideas which come before the public and should come before the public and that is the official position. My own views don't really matter. So, sir, coming to the last question, what you will advise our youngsters out there who will be watching this interaction with a lot of enthusiasm about how to handle their future and how to actually make India a more safe and a secure place to live? You know, I, I, I think that our youth is so well informed and our youth is so highly motivated. That is, I do not have to give them too much tips about the knowledge inputs. Probably they browse through this thing that they all know where are the opportunities, what are the suitable, this is what are the openings. But I tell them something about their attitudes that can make life very happy. You have got, we all have an identity. Smaller the identity, smaller the man. Grow in your identity. I have got an identity, I am Ajit Doval. And if I live for Ajit Doval, I have to say that what I eat, what I food, or what are my pleasures and others, that's all. When I do it for the family, my identity becomes a bigger one. When I live for my village, it is still large. Village. It's this thing that I belong to such and such village. Or some people get to the caste identity. And then you say that you are a caste, this is. You are growing, but not growing big enough. Identify your identity with your nation. You become the part of a much larger family. Today, my identity is an Indian. I don't have my caste identity, I don't have my linguistic identity or my ethnic identity. It's an Indian identity. That's why I feel that is, I'm as big as India. Each Indian must feel that way. That is an attitude to this thing. Then, when you are looking at something dirty happening to your country or somebody is cutting the this thing of your railway seat or you find that some dirt is filthy, this thing, you feel bad. You think somebody is dirtying your country. If somebody speaks against it, you know, I don't have time, otherwise I would have told you the incidents that once in a ship from Vivekananda was going from uh, Japan to the US and he observed one thing, that the one Indian who had taken the ship ticket but not of the, uh, of the, of the food or something and therefore he was only given some snacks and not the proper food. Then he started sort of being abusive or listening to the Japanese, telling that, well, this is discrimination, it is this thing, because probably he didn't understand the language, so he didn't have this thing. One Japanese got up and said, this is the food. Till the ship reaches, I'll keep on, I will not eat and give it to you. But one word against Japan from you, and I'll throw you out of the ship. He could give away his food, but he could not hear anything adverse or anything uh, negative or uh, scandalous about his own country. Now, that is the spirit. Develop that spirit of this thing. Identify, bigger, bigger man, bigger heart, bigger mind. Get away the small things, small insults, small gains, small comforts, small these things. Become a bigger this thing. You become still bigger, you become the whole, you know, the whole humanity belongs to you. Like Buddha or Gandhiji or Vivekananda. Well, you know, you become, you become still bigger identity that I am a human being. Our Vedas gave us this is still bigger identity that I am a living being. So I identify myself with everything that has got a life. Some people came beyond that. But it gave me the Nirakar Brahma, that is everything, whether it has got a life or without life, is part of me and I am part of it. That is Ahimosme Brahma or Shiva. Shiva. Yeah. So that is how you increase in these things. Materialism, modern values, are making you from a bigger man to a smaller man, to a smaller man, to a smaller man. You are, you are shrinking to you and maybe to your wife and to your children. Even your parents don't matter much. Even relations don't matter much. Your society doesn't matter much. Nation doesn't matter. It is for me. And that is what I'll say that will bring about an attitude and a change. Be a proud Indian and live for India. And whatever you can do, you will have a lot of happiness. Even if you die in the process, you will be proud of it. Dying in any case is inevitable for all of us, but you will be proud to have this thing. I lived the life well and I had the death that I deserved. So, 
let's close this on this very positive note sir so it was really pleasure thank talking you to you thank you thank very you, much thank you very much thank you very much for your time and patience yes.